everybody. Um, we're going to get started if it's okay. Hi. My mother's waving furiously. She came down from Scranton to say hello and <laughs> lend her support. I think the first lesson is that regardless of your background, having your family in your corner is never a bad thing. Um, I want to begin by introducing our two panelists. Uh, in your programs, you have biographical information on all of them, so I won't spend time rehashing you know, what it is that they've done, but uh, Senator Sila Maria Gonzalez Calderon uh, is joining us from Puerto Rico, uh, which is where she serves as a, a senator in the Popular Party uh, in Puerto Rico. She's going to tell a little bit about what that means so that everyone has some context of Puerto Rican politics here. Uh, it's a very different system. Um, but previously, she had served um, with her mother's administration when her mother was governor of Puerto Rico as the first lady. Uh, and prior to that, she had worked as a corporate attorney and as an environmental lawyer for the EPA. And we're also joined by Matthew Asada, uh, who's special assistant to the special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, he joined the Foreign Service in 2003. He speaks a bajillion languages, which you can read in your program. Uh, and he's held a number of posts across the world. Um, and I'll have him speak a little bit about those. Um, so we wanted to begin by just diving into the topic of diversity, politics, and in order to do that, we felt that we should talk a bit about the institutions that govern politics. Um, all of us are, as you know, constrained by the organizations um, that we join, um, associated with the groups and educational background which we've attained over time. Um, so I thought we could begin by asking what our respective institutions have done to promote and foster diversity in their ranks. I think very uh, important to the last 50 or so years is that a consensus has emerged uh, popularly that it is organization organizationally beneficial to have people of diverse backgrounds and experiences fill positions of leadership um, in order to avoid groupthink, in order to make sure that various groups are represented, um, and to enhance the quality of talent that we get in the ranks of the institutions that really guide our society. So, uh, I thought Senator Calderon could begin um, by describing, you know, what she thinks the Senate has done and also um, her party has done in promoting diversity within its ranks. Well, first of all, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I should uh, put two things before I, before I begin. Uh, I'm, I'm not a minority in my own country, which is Puerto Rico. But I lived here for uh, 10 years in the United States. I, as I, as uh, Jess, Jeff has said, uh, I was here at Penn for four years, then went to Boston University Law School, and then uh, remained uh, in Massachusetts in Boston for uh, two more years. So I know what it feels to be a minority and what it is to be a minority. Now in the Senate of Puerto Rico, I'm the only woman in my delegation. So I have to say that as the only woman in my delegation, yes, <laughs> I feel like a minority within my own country and within my own uh, party, political party. And Jesse, uh, Jeff, Jess asks us, what has our have our institutions done? Well, I'm in my second four-year term, and the experience has been totally different. In the first term, we had a women's caucus, and what I found out through that women's caucus, which we were able to have with the representatives and senators uh, from uh, both chambers, that we were able to raise awareness to the issues that had to do with women rights, with gender rights, different genders. And uh, this term, we were not able for political differences. Within the same parties, we weren't able to have a women's caucus, and we have seen that the, that the the fact that we, didn't, we weren't able to have a women's caucus, it has resulted in no legislation on, on women's issues. We have separate, totally separate opinions, and we have, haven't been able to raise our voice, a unified voice, as to the issues that pertain to women. This term particularly, we have uh, a majority of legislators which are very, who are very conservative, and what has meant has we not only have that situation, but on top of that, we do not have a women's caucus. So uh, the message that I want to uh, bring across is that we need to form coalitions, that we need, 
even though we may have differences, that even within minority groups, we have differences. Latinos, uh, depending on where you're from, you may have different issues, but we have to put those differences aside and we need to get our uh, commonalities so we can raise a unifying voice in order to make our points across. And I think that's very important that that's a message that I want to bring to all of you because to the extent that here in the United States there are many different groups, uh, many different minority groups and differences between minority groups to the extent that we do not get a, a make a unifying voice, uh, there's so many issues that some of them are just going to get lost. Senator, can you, can you briefly talk about the different steps that have been taken to increase the number of women in politics? Puerto well, Rico? I have to say, uh, particularly in my political party, and, and maybe I should give a brief a summary of, of what the different parties, uh, political parties are in Puerto Rico. We have uh, the status issue. I don't know how familiar you are with the Puerto Rican political arena or scenario. We have a, a political party that is centered on the idea that Puerto Rico should become a state of the United States. We have another party, which is the party that I belong to, uh, which believes that Puerto Rico should remain as a commonwealth, that we can improve the special relationship that we have with the United States, but that we are, we are a different nation. We want to maintain our, our cultural identity, we want to maintain our language, and we want to stay as we are. And there's a third party, which is a smaller party, which believes in totally national independence. So uh, once that is said, uh, my party, for whatever reason, and I still, I'm, as I said, I'm the only woman in, in my Senate delegation, has not been successful in uh, electing women to different positions, even though my mother was the first woman governor, and the only one right now, uh, so, and, and to that extent, I've, I've been thinking uh, that we, that one of the challenges that we have in Puerto Rico and that you have here in the United States is that once Obama is elected, that he does not become the only uh, minority to be elected president because it, he might have opened the door or he might have uh, raised to the challenge and, and he was elected, but after that, what? what? What can we, when we look to the future, we cannot say, oh, we had one uh, African-American president, but more than that, what about the rest of the people that are coming after us? And I think to the extent that my political party hasn't done enough and hasn't taken the steps to not only open the door, it's more than that, it's to, to make sure that uh, minorities, and in this case women, are elected, continue to be elected to these kind of positions. I think we still, women in the case of Puerto Rico and here minorities still have to work three times as hard to get to the same positions where uh, white uh, fem uh, males or white females are getting to. So I think that's a challenge for all of us here in Puerto Rico and here in the United States. Okay. Uh, Mr. Asada, can you talk a little bit about the State Department and your interaction with various government agencies? Yeah. Um, I just want to start out by saying that the maybe the foregone conclusion that diversity is an advantage for diplomacy, I don't think that was always accepted. And if we look back only till the mid-70s, uh, I'll take the example of, of a woman who were serving in the Foreign Service, they had to resign their positions when they were married. And it wasn't really until the 80s and 90s that there was a real significant push to increase minority hiring and minority recruitment, which is somewhat ironic uh, since diversity and diplomacy have something in common, and that is that both of these topics are dealing with identifying commonalities that we have with one another, commonalities that the United States has with other countries, and uh, recognizing those differences. And really, the borders and intersections, whether they're with groups, whether they're with nations, that's really where I think the most gains are to be made or the conflicts can erupt. But the fact that a diverse foreign service was in the interest of the United States was not always accepted. Today, we look at it, we see the values of having linguistic diversity, we see the values of having an ethnic diversity, a religious diversity, a uh, orientation, gender, diversity. And now that is, I think, an accepted conclusion. But 
It really was, I'd say, in the last uh, several administrations, both in the Bush administration and the Obama administration, with our secretaries of state, the personalities that we had in place. We had gentlemen like uh, Secretary Powell, who came and revolutionized the Foreign Service. And he set out to actually recruit a thousand more diplomats than we've ever had before in what they call the Diplomatic Readiness Initiative. And this was very much focused on increasing our minority recruitment and outreach. Following that, we had Secretary Rice, again, another proponent of a diverse foreign service. And right now, again, with Secretary Clinton, that has just continued. And it's important because they have led institutions and changed, these in changed this institution to recognize the value of diversity. And I've done it in a couple of different areas that I just wanted to highlight for you. One is in recruitment. Again, there's a strong push to recruit, uh, whether it's ethnic, whether it's culture, whether it's religious, whether it's linguistic diversity, uh, minorities into the Foreign Service. And that's done through uh, target of opportunities. It's done by recruiting at you know, historically black colleges. It's done by recruiting at uh, centers of excellence for Asian American studies, for instance. The second is that it actually increased benefits. Um, again, it wasn't until Secretary Rice that they even uh, acknowledged what uh, members of household, so non-married same-sex partners. That was, I think, a fundamental change in the Foreign Service. I mean, one of the gripes had long been the case that a employee's, a married heterosexual couple's pet, a dog or a cat, was treated better than an unmarried same-sex partner. Um, the same-sex partner did not receive airfare to go to and from the partner's uh, place of assignment, whereas the government would pay for you to ship your pet. I mean, that was, I think, the most stark example. And that's changed now. I mean, Secretary Clinton fulfilled one of the administration's promises in extending benefits to same-sex uh, partners. It's been incorporated into our evaluation performance culture at the Department of State, where in every one of our work requirements, uh, promoting a diverse workforce is something that we're expected to do and that our superiors hold us to doing. It's something that goes into our promotion precepts. Did you, what proactive steps? Again, not just that you were EEO compliant. I think that's a bare minimum. That's a legal uh, requirement. But what did you do to proactively promote diversity in the workplace? And again, that's a, that's a shift. It's a generational shift. It's a, it's a shift of culture. But that's something that's taken root. And finally, it's in the last, again, the last probably, uh, the last decade that they've really focused on the value of having uh, minorities in the service through spotlighting them in different, you know, it's Asian American month. It's Hispanic, it's African American, again, spotlighting individuals uh, that have reached the highest ranks of the Foreign Service. It's in promoting the training and making it available to different people. But the idea, which seems like a no-brainer, that a diverse Foreign Service was good for the United States, it took a long time for that to come about. And I will say, though, today that I think we're in a position where that is accepted as a consensus and their institution has changed to promote it because of our uh, leadership that has recognized the value. And now it's a question of ensuring that that talent development continues for the next generation. Can you talk a little bit about the initiative to increase diversity, the adding 1,000 diplomats? Has it been successful? What, what are the benchmarks that have been met? Is, is there a plan to expand it? Well, if you look at it today, um, again, Secretary Powell had a diplomatic readiness initiative to increase the size of the Foreign Service. This is something that's oftentimes, um, I mean, I'll give you an example. There's only 5,000 diplomats worldwide, Foreign Service officers. There's 5,000 specialists as well. But that's nothing compared to the size of the U.S. military. I mean, it's oftentimes stated that, you know, there's more members of the United States military bands than there are actually Foreign Service officers. Um, so Secretary uh, Powell wanted to do something about that. You know, he put on this diplomatic readiness initiative to allow us to have a so-called training float 
that would ensure we had an extra complement, 10% of the foreign service, that could go and do long-term training assignments like he was used to in the military. He said, oftentimes, the anecdote, as a senior officer, as a general officer, he probably spent of his career more than two years, three years, four years in training, whereas a t similar diplomat at that position would have spent a maximum of maybe one year. So we tried to do that. Unfortunately, uh, again, that surge was sucked up, as you know, by Iraq, by Afghanistan, by the wars that are ongoing. Secretary Clinton has also uh, launched an initiative 3.0 to hire an additional above attrition increase into the Foreign Service, and it has been successful. I mean, if you look at a new class of Foreign Service officers, they represent the best of America. They represent the diverse nature. Again, 50-50 male-female, um, a significant minority participation, uh, with the exception of there are not that many um, Latinos in the Foreign Service. We have to do better there. Um, there are a lot of Asian Americans, um, but what people sometimes cite is, again, I mean, we, talked, we talked about this earlier this morning about you know, the differences between graduate students and faculty placements. You still have that difference in the Foreign Service. If you look at you know, incoming, yes, the incoming classes are very diverse, but to build and generate and develop an ambassador, that takes 20 years, 25 years, and you still have an overwhelming percentage of you know, male ambassadors uh, that are not political appointees. You have uh, more or less diverse uh, ambassadorial ranks, but that's just a product, again, a little bit of the time that it takes to generate that ambassadorial rank. But as far as diversifying the incoming classes, they've done a very good job of that. And what we've seen since September 11th, too, is diversifying the, I think, the religious makeup of our foreign service. And this is very important because as we talked about in the last panel, or the one I attended on civil rights, um, about how an incident of Islamophobia can affect the security of the United States, it's very true. I mean, what a pastor in Florida does affects the physical security of our embassies and consulates overseas. It affects the security of our troops that are fighting in Afghanistan and different places. And by having a more religiously diverse foreign service or a foreign service that is more familiar with different religions overseas representing the United States, that increases our security and our preparedness. I'm going to add to my answer because I introduced a bill which has not been approved, but which I introduced trying to uh, resolve the situation with a poor participation of women in, in uh, Puerto Rico politics, uh, it, was a it is a bill which require a minimum number of women as candidates in order for a political party to maintain its uh, registration. Uh, the Dominican Republic and Spain have si similar laws. It's not supposed to be a quota, but a minimum uh, percentage uh, so that women are allowed uh, the space to run because what we're seeing uh, in my party, for example, is that uh, women are just not running for those positions in Puerto Rico as in the United States. Uh, we have uh, the population, more than 50% is women uh, today, and we're seeing a minimum number of women uh, participating. And I think uh, to the extent that we have to give open an opportunity for, for women to participate and to move along uh, in the political arena, we have uh, an obligation. Uh, and I think it's important uh, because, again, if we do not have uh, minorities, either women or, or ethnic groups or, or, or other minority groups, in key positions, the issues are not going to be uh, taken care of. The issues are not going to be raised. I see it all, my, all the time in my delegation, being the only woman. Uh, we, ha we are passing laws every day, and most of them affect some way or another oh, female, women. And, the, and, you know, there might be, you know, I don't want to say that males are not sensitive enough that they do not realize uh, how it affects the uh, female population, but the truth is that sometimes they don't think about the consequences of some of the laws that we are passing. 
and it's not until I uh, raise my voice, uh, you know, and, it's, and I can't say it's easy. It's not easy. Politics is not easy. And for a minority, for a woman or for a minority, it's not easy, and it won't be easy. And, and we, have to, uh, we have a responsibility, and I feel like I have a responsibility in Puerto Rico to make sure that more women uh, participate. And I think that minorities here in the United States and those, who have, those of us who have reached positions and those of us, of, of us who have had the opportunity to come to Penn and who have more and more opportunities than that people who have not been able, minorities who have not been able for whatever reason to study, to open those doors and to make those opportunities available so that we can raise our voices and make sure that uh, where decision making processes are, are uh, done, that uh, the issues are brought up. Um, well, and I guess I'll just chime in too about the institution of the United States Senate. Um, I think the American public knows that the Senate is is not representative of, of the whole country. You don't have, um, certainly not 50% of it is, is female. You don't have uh, more than one African American serving right now. Um, certain states are better at sending people of diverse background uh, to the Senate. Illinois is probably the best. Senator Carol Mosley Brown, Senator Barack Obama, uh, Senator Roland Buris. Luis Gutierrez, who's. But, yes. Well, he's, he's in the House. and uh -huh. uh, and. The House is much better. Um, you know, people on the Hill refer to it as the People's House because <laughs> you get a much more diverse group uh, within the Senate. So we could probably talk all day about why it is that we don't have more minorities elected to the U.S. Senate um, or to the House. But um, I thought it might be helpful too to talk a little bit about staff, maybe because I am a staffer. Um, I think the ranks of the staff are much more diverse. Uh, I think that uh, most offices like to have staff that is representative of their district uh, and that that is beneficial. So while a lot of the people at the top are not um, people from diverse ethnic backgrounds um, or uh, female, they try to make sure that they have a lot of different opinions coming their way um, from different corners of their states. Um, I think that the, well, we have in the, in, in the Congress institutions like the caucuses um, and the staff associations set up to recruit more people. Uh, in the Senate, uh, we have staff associations for African Americans, people with disabilities, the women's group. Uh, you have one group for LGBT folks. And those associations are very good, I think, at fostering diversity. They make sure that when jobs are available in different positions, that as many people as possible within those groups know about them. Um, but that type of recruiting doesn't work for those folks at the top. Um, and so we have been working with a number of caucuses, but the issue is that there is a caucus for just about everything. Um, one of the you know, more interesting is that Tammy Baldwin, a representative from Wisconsin, you know, is the chair of the Swiss caucus, which takes a special interest in Switzerland. Um, and so you have these small interest group caucuses, some on technology, some on free internet, and so you have a wide variety of caucuses that are doing things. The caucuses that are the best staffed uh, are, I think, the ethnic minority caucuses, the Tea Party caucuses, and some of the, the small government uh, ones. Um, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus uh, and the, the caucus on uh, LGBT rights, they serve a very important function, and that is to make sure that these issues are discussed, that events are held on the Hill, among people uh, who are working on this legislation so they're aware of how it may impact. And I think the greatest change to the Senate you know, in the last few decades is that now these caucuses are realizing that it isn't necessarily about passing the specific legislative agenda of that group. So in the case of Latinos, comprehensive immigration reform. The caucus, its sole job isn't simply to pass comprehensive immigration reform. It's to make sure that when we're having a bill on nutrition, uh, Latino families are included, that bilingual information campaigns are sponsored. Um, you know, the women's group makes sure that healthcare makes sure that uh, we attend to the needs of women and whatnot. And so it's trying, the effort of the caucuses is I think very good in trying to make sure that every issue, no matter what it is, looks at these issues of access and inclusivity and diversity and works to integrate them into US policy. And I think in that regard, there has been a lot of success, but as everyone in this room, I think, knows there's a lot more work to be done. Um, 
So I wanted to go and, and, and get a little lighthearted for a second, Senator. Um, you were the first lady for your mother while serving, when, while she was governor of Puerto Rico. You grew up, she was the mayor of San Juan. You'd been in politics for quite some time, but this was your first major public role on the island. Can you talk about why it is that you decided to take on this role? You know, a lot of family members of famous politicians decide that they don't want anything to do <laughs> with the game of politics. Um, what is it that made you decide to take the role and why did you focus on the issues you did when you were there? Um, well, I have to say that before she became governor of Puerto Rico, I had shied away uh, from politics, not only because I was busy working as an attorney, but I was having my three children at the time, so it was, I was, it was a pretty busy time for me. But once uh, she becomes governor and asks me uh, to uh, work in the office of the First Lady, I couldn't say no because there were, uh, it wasn't not only, a, it was a time where I felt not only that I could give back to her, but I could give back to my country. Uh, the situation in Puerto Rico with the public school system, which is, uh, to me, one of the, mo the, the most important reason for deciding to, to work with her as a first lady and then later on to run for the Senate, uh, we have a situation where uh, this public school system, for whatever reason, even though it's getting billions and billions and billions of dollars poured into it, uh, we still have a high dropout rate. Uh, the schools, uh, the we are not being able to attract uh, good teachers. We, in Puerto Rico, federal law applies, so we have the No Child Left Behind law, and we can talk about that later, uh, applied to uh, the school system in Puerto Rico. And also the fact that there are uh, so many poor communities and that I felt that I, it was the opportunity to be able to uh, go to those poor communities and try to empower them so that their voices could be heard. And basically, I, during my tenure as First Lady, I concentrated on those two areas, education and the poor communities. And uh, I was thinking while I was walking towards uh, this hall that I remembered uh, when my mother decided not to run again uh, I was in a poor community, about an, uh, away from, from the metropolitan area, and I was, as I was leaving, this gentleman uh, came, came towards my car and said, please do not abandon us. And it made me think what he meant, and, and I knew what he meant, because uh, for so much, for uh, more than four decades in Puerto Rico, uh, poverty was not talked about. Uh, the poor people were in isolated areas and people seem to have forgotten because there have been so much economical growth in those 40 years that uh, there were cer certain areas that had been forgotten and poverty was not talked about, it was forgotten. And uh, for the first time during my mother's tenure, uh, we had focused on poverty, and uh, during, my, during these past six years uh, in the Senate, I've uh, tried uh, not only, obviously, as I mentioned before, dealing with, uh, with women's issues and educational issues, but try to maintain the discussion of poverty in the legislature because to the extent that we do not empower these groups and that we do not bring economic uh, development to these areas, we are not going to be able to solve many issues in Puerto Rico, which is the same thing with education. To the extent that the access to education is not the best, to the extent that we do not, uh, that the dropout rate, as I said, continues to increase, uh, we are not going to solve problems like crime. We are not going to solve uh, other problems that affect everybody. And I think uh, it's important, not only in Puerto Rico, but here in the United States, and as I know, uh, the problem with education, minorities still have, uh, there's still a very high dropout rate. And uh, we still see uh, uh, not the best access to education. Minority groups are still having problem accessing education even more higher education. And I think it's something that we all have a responsibility. And I think all of us here in this room have a, a very big responsibility in our communities to make sure that uh, the groups that we 
uh, our members of our represent have access to education and are empowered in their community so that uh, we are not left out and that they are not left out uh, wherever we, we live. I think it's very important. I think we all have a social responsibility. I made the decision. I don't regret it. It hasn't been easy, particularly as I mentioned, being politics and being the only woman in my delegation, in my party. But uh, I think it's worth it. Uh, I don't regret it. I think uh, we all have a responsibility. Uh, I remember while I was at Penn, uh, I tutored in a public school across uh, the river, and I never thought in my mind that I would end up spending so much time in schools later on in my life as I visit throughout the island and to look with my own eyes the situation that we have. Uh, so I think it's important to get involved and I know, uh, I don't know if we have students here, but uh, no matter where we are, I think it's very important to get involved, particularly with education because it's, uh, it's the future of our country. Um, so, Mr. Sada, I thought uh, I'd ask you if you could recall an instance where your cultural background, having globetrotted and with your family in the army, speaking German and Urdu and Hindi, um, was able to give you an enhanced understanding that some of your colleagues didn't have. Well, I think that, um, I think this is off right now, <laughs> but I'll speak up. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm Japanese American, I'm fourth generation, and father is Japanese, mother is Caucasian, and I very much grew up, though, in a, what we consider, you know, a pretty typical family household, and it really wasn't, I mean, when I was in school, I remember taking the Scantron test and, you know, filling out the boxes on your name, and then uh, the teacher telling me that, you know, you need to mark the Caucasian box, and I said, um, I don't think so. <laughs> but um, so it's kind of becoming aware of our differences and becoming aware of our commonalities with other people. But my background as an Asian American has impressed upon me the value of family and the importance of family. And that's something that cuts across, I think, all religious, ethnic, linguistic, cultural backgrounds. But it does mean that when I go overseas and I'm going to, for instance, South Asia, to India, to Pakistan, to Afghanistan, where the family plays such a critical and crucial role, it allows me to understand them better. I understand you know, the uh, Japanese concepts of hospitality, the importance of gifts. Uh, I understand the, what it means by living in an extended joint family um, that my grandparents had. Uh, my personal family did not because of my father, but you know my aunts and uncles do. And so that, it, it gives you an advantage um, that I'm able to relate and connect to Indians uh, that are living with their grandparents and their great-grandparents and their father um, that others may not necessarily have. And I think it's, again, what's most important in our discussions for today is coming back to the idea it's really about how you can reach out beyond your individual community to another. How do you relate to another group, whatever the kind of group it is, with another nation, whatever type of nation that is? I mean, that's really uh, what I understand by appreciating the value of diversity and living a life of tolerance. And how do we practice that as you know, individuals in our daily lives, but more importantly, as leaders of institutions, be it business, government, social nonprofit, or even again as a nation. And I'll come back to, you know, bring it up a little higher that, you know, President Obama has, in his short uh, time in office, had an unprecedented outreach to the Muslim world. He recognized that the United States had done irreparable, not irreparable, but harm to its relations, and that it needed to improve those. So he had you know, a major landmark speech in Cairo on outreach and engagement with the Muslim world. He appointed special representative to Muslim communities, Farah Pandit, to build better relations there, a special envoy to the OIC. 
all of these efforts to, again, to build that bridge with a significant portion of the world's population. Again, not that it would necessarily change any of our policies, but the fact that we weren't even engaging before and that we didn't even understand. Uh, that was what was most, um, you know, damning, I think, in some of our, you know, co uh, overseas and other citizens' eyes is that the United States was not making that effort. But that's changed, and I think that's, a, you know, very valuable to change, that even if our policies have not. In some ways they have, some ways they haven't. We talked this morning already about that. But the idea that we're making that outreach and we're engaging and that we're willing to do it, I think that's the uh, effort that everyone commends President Obama for. And, and what do you think are some of the benefits of that engagement with the Muslim world? I mean, you can see it in the job that I'm doing right now with Special Representative uh, for Af Afghanistan Ambassador, Ambassador, or Afghanistan and Pakistan Ambassador Holbrook. When Obama came into office, he created this position, he appointed Ambassador Holbrook to it, and what happened and followed is that more than 40 countries around the world appointed special representatives for Afghanistan and Pakistan, including an unprecedented number of Islamic countries. Now, the moral persuasion of having Muslim countries that are working with us in Afghanistan and Pakistan sends a strong signal to the world that this is not a West versus Islam, that this is not you know, Christian versus Muslim. This is about an international, again, building those partnerships of understanding to confront one of these challenges. But that is a very tangible benefit that, again, the last administration did not do. And it's something that continues to pay off benefits as we look to the future as actually more Muslim countries decide to send representatives, uh, appoint special representatives for Afghanistan and Pakistan, as we see the level of engagement in the next year increase, again, with re countries in that region, and as we look to bringing up a resolution to the conflict. Um, and Senator, I was wondering if you could talk about your experience as a mother in politics and uh, how your experiences with your children have led you to propose legislation or to take up certain causes or feel a certain passion over issues that you might not otherwise have. I didn't know you were going to ask that question and I'm, I don't think you're ready. I'd like to throw a curveball, you know. No, but <laughs> but it's, a, it's a wonderful question and actually very interesting because, um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I started visiting schools and looking at the different situations that the schools in Puerto Rico had, I realized uh, how important it was, not only for the academic part, which is also obviously very important, which, and where we are in very bad shape in Puerto Rico, but also the fact that the schools weren't safe. And I have to say that was uh, almost 10 years ago. I can't say right now that they are better than they were 10 years ago. Unfortunately, uh, even though, as I said before, millions and millions of dollars have been poured into the system, uh, schools are worse off. But going back to your question, uh, being a politician, being a female, and being a mother, uh, obviously not only uh, makes me more aware of certain issues, but it has made my job harder in many ways. Uh, I can give you one example. I remember one day, particularly, we were in session and my fellow senators were discussing all the places they had to go in the afternoon. After we finished the session, they had to go and give speeches different places. And I had my kids calling me that afternoon. I also had to go places and give, uh, I had to go to two places after the end of the session. I had my kids 
calling me that they had certain school projects for the next day. I'm also a single mom, I, I, I'm divorced. And, uh, and I had to get them uh, certain things before going out and, and, and giving the speeches that I had to give. And here I am looking at my fellow centers who are worried that they're not gonna get to where they have to go. And before I had to go get to where I had to go, I had to stop, I had to stop and buy the things, study with my kids and finally go out and give the, the, the uh, speeches that I had to give wherever I was going. And, and you know, it's, it definitely, uh, and when you spoke about the role of family, I think it's very important for uh, people who are in politics and, and for females to have a very good supportive family. In my case, I have a wonderful mother, but she's not a babysitter. And <laughs> she doesn't study with my children. She's very busy herself. Uh, so to the extent that, that when you're in politics and when you're a woman, no matter, I think, no matter what job you're in, uh, to have a, a good uh, group of people that helps you, uh, it makes the job easier because uh, I think that, that we need to be aware, uh, and I think women for decades, decades have tried to be the same as men. And you know, this uh, female uh, liberation, it was wonderful for all of us, but at the same time, it has made us have more responsibilities. And to the extent that we do not realize that we are different, that we give birth, and that our responsibilities, no matter how much uh, the female uh, movement uh, has come along, uh, the truth is, and at the end of the day, uh, unfortunately, many of us have much more responsibilities than the men do because, uh, a, I mean, at least in my experience, what I've seen in Puerto Rico, I don't know if things here are, are different, but at, you know, even though uh, they are, you know, uh, male companions are uh, much more liberated too, uh, at the end of the day, we end up doing everything ourselves. So. <laughs> Uh, I have to say, it's not easy, it can be done, I have done it, but I, you know, it's, it's been, I've heard my children, I've had uh, my share of, now that they are older and they tell me, oh, you have another session, or you're going to this, or you're going there, you know, I, now my oldest is uh, uh, freshman in high school, uh, it doesn't get any easier, okay. but I, I try to organize myself, I try to balance, as I said to my staff, I cannot be defending the children of Puerto Rico when I, I'm not defending my own children. I have to take care of my own children before taking care of the children of the rest of the Puerto Ricans. So, so I, have, I try to balance uh, my day and my, and my work agenda so I can get everything done. And uh, I don't consider myself superwoman. I don't think we can, all of any of us, consider ourselves superwomen. Uh, we just have to get the, the work done and, and try to do it the best as possible under the circumstances, understanding that, that, there, that we are different. And I think everybody has to understand that no matter where you are working, uh, and I think to that extent, we still have a long way to go. Okay. Um, I think we're gonna have one larger question and then we'll begin to take some questions from the audience. Uh, and I'll actually give my response first to the question. And um, what I want to know is if you can describe some of the barriers to progress uh, within your different institutions and what we can do to uh, eliminate those barriers or uh, lessen their effect. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the issue uh, that has been consuming my time for the last few months, and that is the issue of bullying in schools. Mm -hmm. Um, I think over the last month there have been a number of grisly reminders of how harmful the sustained torture of children can be for them. Um, a number of suicides uh, have taken place over the last month, uh, and those are the instances of bullying that have gotten a lot of attention, but thousands of kids are bullied every day. Um, I took up this issue in part obviously because Senator Casey has said that it's extremely important to him that we make sure that kids are given the opportunity to grow in school. Uh, that any time a child fails to reach his potential or her potential, it's a disservice to everybody. And so in government, we have an obligation to make sure that kids are safe uh, and that their creativity and, po and potential is, is fostered. So there was a, a series of surveys that were done and studies that were done of kids. Uh, we found in Pennsylvania, 52% of kids uh, identify themselves as feeling very unsafe in school. So 52% is a staggering number. 
And I think we, you know, we all know that bullying is an issue, but we didn't realize it was that extensive. Over 90% of kids who were bullied said that when they told their teacher or their administrator that they were being bullied or harassed, that they got no response. And so this to us represents a real failure uh, and something that we really need to tackle. And so the Senator proposed legislation called the Safe Schools Improvement Act. Um, very, very rarely in education uh, do teachers, superintendents, parents, and administrative groups all get together and think that something is a really good idea. Um, and when we did this, uh, over 60 groups signed on, uh, most national Latino, Asian American, Pacific Islander, African American groups signed on to the legislation in support. Disabilities advocates said that this is a great idea. Uh, as you can imagine, children with disabilities, physical handicaps, and um, you know, chronic things like autism uh, are much more susceptible to bullying. Um, some of you may have heard the story about the uh, child with cerebral palsy who was bullied and the parent flipped out on the bus uh, and triggered a, a nationwide debate about what it is that parents can do. I think for millions of parents, this was a story that captured their attention because they've been experiencing the same frustration. Their kid goes to school and comes back unsafe. And so when we proposed this legislation, um, which really asks schools to keep data and then also allows each individual school district to write its own plan, but said that every, every school should have a plan for dealing with bullying, should have a plan for dealing with harassment. So it allows you know, localities to decide for themselves. We didn't think that this was going to be as controversial as it is. Um, Senator Casey was named uh, the number one enemy of the family uh, by one of the conservative groups that didn't think that the government should be involved uh, in anti-bullying in this way. And we've been fighting tooth and nail over the last few months to bring attention to the legislation and to the issue of bullying. Um, and so I think that this is a huge issue of diversity. I think all of us talked about the challenges of education, getting the most number of kids into school, uh, getting them into college, and then getting them to grad school. The credentials that you need to really excel, I think, in political world um, is very challenging. Uh, kids that are bullied are less likely to pay attention. They're more likely to skip school they're more likely to drop out of school. Uh, and so there are little things that we need to do beginning at the very earliest stages to make sure that children are pipelined into politics. They have to get an education. They have to be um, you know, getting the resources of community and their family. Um, so for me, this is a huge barrier, the issue of early childhood education and safe schools. Um, so the things that we can do are exactly what I said. We need to begin understanding the problem. We need to begin having these conversations at the community level about how to best protect kids and keep them in school. Um, and I could talk all day about higher ed uh, and graduate school, but I think that that's a really good place to begin and I think a place where we can have a broad consensus built uh, and address the problem. So you, know, you can talk about some of the barriers and then. I'm, I'm going to change the subject completely. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about education, no. Uh, but I'm going to talk about a situation that we have in Puerto Rico right now that might be similar to a certain extent uh, here in the States. We have uh, many religious and fundamental gr fundamentalist groups that are playing a very important uh, role right now in the legislation that is being approved in the, uh, in this, in the Legislative Assembly in Puerto Rico. For whatever reason, we have a, we have a governor now who's uh, from the statehood party. Uh, he's a Republican. Uh, not if there's a Republican here, no problem, but I want to say uh, his, his uh, background is very conservative and we see uh, that we have a legis legislative assembly which is very conservative also. And right now what we're seeing is that, we, that these uh, religious groups are exercising uh, a lot of power uh, in this legislative assembly. Uh, well, for example, we have uh, a bill that has been introduced to raise the institution of marriage to a constitutional level. In Puerto Rico, we have a constitution uh, which is separate from the constitution of the US. Uh, we cannot approve anything in the Constitution that is contrary to the U.S. Constitution, but we can expand 
our rights more than the United States. For example, we have a, a right to privacy, which, which, which is more extensive than the right to privacy in the United States. But uh, the effect of this uh, proposed legislation of raising the institution of marriage to a constitutional level means uh, has the implication uh, for example, in terms of uh, rights for LGBT uh, groups, it, it has uh, uh, implications to couples who are not married and their rights and their children's rights. And what we're seeing is that uh, even though we should be uh, finding more liberal groups and, and uh, in general, society might be moving towards more liberal positions. We have seen in Puerto Rico that for whatever reason, the religious groups are exercising more power now and, and are more powerful and are, are uh, with, with their, not only because they're very vocal, but also they're pouring money into the uh, campaigns of the politicians and what we're seeing is this kind of legislation that to me moves us back 20, 30, 40 years. So, so at this point, we are we have a challenge there. We have a. I think it's I, I think it's a barrier. Uh, I think it's very hypocritical of many people, and I think and that's one thing that I have said because uh, the same people that are uh, defending the institution of marriage are the first ones that do not uh, uh, that are not uh, acting accordingly. So <laughs> I think that's a <laughs> diplomatic way of saying what, uh, what's happening. Uh, and I think that uh, it is important, uh, and I bring this up because uh, this is a, a panel or, or a weekend on diversity, and diversity is much more than racial diversity. And to the extent that uh, when we have groups that are uh, fighting for things that are going to bring us back so many years, when we have, uh, when our different groups have fought so hard and all these rights uh, and laws that have been passed have been the result of so much struggle and so many fights, I think we have to uh, put our foot down and we really have to make a case against uh, moving backwards. I think uh, for all the minority groups uh, here that are represented and those that are not represented here in this room, uh, we need to make sure that we do not go back uh, when we have achieved so much and when there's so much more to, to achieve at this point. Okay. I mean, I'll keep this uh, short because I know um, there might be some questions out in the uh, audience as well. But I have to be actually a little bit maybe rosy-eyed in saying that I, in the Department of State, I don't see any institutional barriers to a more diverse workplace, any institutional barriers. I'll come back to that there are deficits of minorities in senior leadership positions, which part of which can be corrected just through time as officers come up through the ranks. Um, again, it takes 20 years to make an ambassador, and uh, some of these changes are very new, the ones I was describing. However, some of them can also be done through, obviously, presidential appointments, because you know a third of the Foreign Service uh, for the ambassadorial positions are appointed, and you have the appointed positions within the Department of State, you know, the secretary, deputy, undersecretary, assistant secretary, some of the deputy assistant secretaries, those can, are also done through appointments. So by appointing people of diverse backgrounds, and again, as we mentioned, not just racial backgrounds, ethnic, linguistic, social, socioeconomic, um, orientation, um, into those positions so that they can in turn serve as mentors to up-and-coming officers, I think that's the most effective way to, for the next step, for the next stage. Because there's no longer, I think, an institutional um, bias. Uh, there's any institutional barriers to assent in the Foreign Service or at the Department of State. But there are certain things that they could proactively do, again, through appointments, that would allow us to develop those mentoring relationships to develop that next generation of leadership. Okay. Are there questions from the audience? Um, I think oh, and please stand and if you want, please let us know your name. Uh, my name is Nicole Hill. Um, I think uh, recruitment is important and training is important, but I think the mentorship issue runs deeper. Um, I'm a psychologist by training, and so um, I think about bias, of course. And one of the 
one of the things is there's a group called Women in Psychology, and they talk about psychology is an area where there are more women in graduate school. So if you look at faculty, depending on how you go, it's, it's, there are very few women, um, let alone minorities. Uh, there are two issues. One, that I think people are not aware that women and minorities uh, ask for a lot less than their white male counterparts. Um, this is certainly true in negotiation, and that actually explains a good deal of the difference in salary between women and men. But also, um, not just that, they just don't ask as much help. Uh, or, and, and in addition, they don't receive as much. So I think one of the issues is you can have formal training, but I think establishing these mentoring relationships and also understanding the fact that women and minorities are um, less inclined for various reasons to ask for help or even be aware that you need to have to ask for help and how to uh, basically be successful in your career or even managing your personal life in your career. So I think that's an issue that um, needs to be part of these programs. Um, the other thing in regards to bias, the group women in psychology did an actual analysis of uh, medical school uh, letters of recommendations. People have graduated medical school were going on to the WC. And one of the things they noticed is that even women who are evaluating evaluate other women um, very subtly but less favorably. And they tend to use words that are like flying to the word, but they work really hard as opposed to being really smart. And so I do think these subtle things actually influence who's getting to the top in very serious ways. If you think about academic that subtlety at the first level can determine perhaps whether you get the professorship or tenure on and on and on. And so I don't think it's enough to recruit people heavily. We see that in computer science, for instance. There are a lot more women going um, majoring that as an undergrad. It's actually improved a lot of the years. But again, you see very few women going to grad school and less uh, faculty and so on and so forth. So um, I guess I want to know what, how the thinking is and what the initiatives are in government for dealing with those kinds of issues. Okay. Well, I have to say that I agree with you, totally. Um, I, I don't know if you were here this morning, but when uh, I think one of the panelists, when, when we were at the Annenberg Center, one of the, the professors mentioned uh, that there weren't that many minorities in, at the faculty level. Uh, I think uh, President Gutman um, was very proud that the school has uh, made so so much advance in terms of recruiting students, and that, the, and that we I think made number one uh, according to Newsweek in terms of the student population. Uh, I believe she said it was 44 percent minority, which I think it's great. I think I mean, and I was very relieved. I don't know if the person is here when he mentioned that his time at Penn he wasn't that happy. Well, let me tell you, I was very unhappy while I was at Penn uh, because I felt very alone. Uh, very, very alone, and uh, and I think to the extent that we need to make sure that there's, in case of this institution, that there are professors, assistant professors, that we have people in the faculty that are minorities, that serve as mentors, that serve as a place where a student can go and, and, and well, you're a psychologist, you know, talk about so many issues that students have because it's, it's not easy being in a, big school as this one and for minority, I think it's even harder. Uh, so uh, in terms of that, I totally agree with you. I think also women are harder on women. Uh, I totally believe that. I, I, I've i seen that uh, where I am and I've one thing that I've come to realize, because I have to say that when I first ran for senator, the women's issue was not an issue for me. And it turned out that particular year that the most votes were received by three women. And the first thing that the press asked us was, what are your, what are your, what's your platform on women's issues? What are you gonna do for women? And I, I looked at her and I was thinking, oh, I'm, I, you know, I, I, the first thing that came to my mind, I have nothing. I, was, I wasn't running on the fact that I was a woman. I was running on my education and poor communities and I really wasn't thinking that I was, some kind of a role model and that, had, that, that women's rights had to be my issue. Uh, it turned out through the years after being in the Senate six years and seeing so many things that I've seen in six years, I have to tell you that women's issues and gender issues have become one of, the most, one of my most important issues right now. 
And uh, to the extent that, as I mentioned before, my political party has not been effective in bringing about or having more women get involved in politics or, 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 or be, get, getting elected, uh, I am uh, trying to make an effort on uh, making sure that women uh, at least run. You cannot control how the voters, I mean, the, you know, it's impossible, and I have, you know, it's impossible to control how the voters vote, but to the extent that we offer, uh, and that we, first of all, that women, first of all, decide to, to run, and then that women uh, uh, participate and, and remain uh, in the race till the very end, because that's another problem that we have, that women begin the race and they never finish it. It's just too hard for them. Uh, I think it's important that we support each other. Uh, this is with regards to women and to any minority group. And, uh, and I think it's important, again, to have that mentorship. Very important. I, when I look back to my penny years, it would have been much, it would have been better. I don't know if it would have been much easier, but it would have been better if I had somebody I could, somebody I could relate to, which I didn't have. Uh, so, uh, again, I, I hope that uh, the school uh, makes a really big effort to try to bring more minorities uh, to positions where they can uh, somehow uh, mentor uh, the diverse population that we have here right now. I mean, I, I didn't mention it, but definitely, my mentoring programs are part and parcel of what we're trying to do to increase the diverse ranks of the Foreign Service. Uh, there's a scholarship program out there. It's called the Pickering Fellowship. It pays for your graduate school. It sends you to an internship, and then it links you with mentors. And then that, and this is a, a program for what they say underrepresented minorities, be it you know black, uh, Asian American, you know Hispanic, uh, also um, females. And it's a group, though, that again, it's not just the initial process, but it's keeping them interested in the foreign service and then following them through their career. And I think that that mentoring program um, has been very valuable and continues to be valuable. And people uh, see it that it's a pro-diversity initiative that one institution or your organization can take that is obviously legally compliant, um, but it's something that pays off. And so, yes, you're right. You can't just go to the school and say, hey, we need to get you know, more people to apply or then more people to matriculate. But rather, once they have matriculated, how do you ensure that they succeed? Um, because again, the Foreign Service is a very small community at the very end of the day. It's 5,000 people. And um, you, you quickly learn everyone that's in the Foreign Service and as you work your way up. So these mentoring groups and relationships, they're, that's going to make the difference about encouraging someone to stay in the Foreign Service, encouraging them to apply for that or to give them guidance as to which position they need to apply for in order to go up the ranks. But you're right, uh, it's a critical element and it's something I think that we that they're doing pretty well actually at the department. Um, I would also like to put in a plug for some of my mentors here at Penn. I had uh, a number of them, Jonathan Steinberg, who's in the history department. We continue to get together every couple months for lunch just to chat. Uh, and one of the things that I was told uh, by a professor in the German department, Katrina McLeod, was that um, the nicest thing you can do for someone that writes you a letter of recommendation or helps you is to keep in touch with them and let them know what you're doing and, uh, and try to touch base. And, and I got great advice from one of my mentors in the Mellon Fellowship Program who said, you know, my whole life, uh, he was an African-American guy. He went to Oberlin and um, rose through the ranks at a time when that was not an easy thing for an African-American guy. And he said, all along the way, I had mentors and people that helped give me a hand up the ladder. Uh, they would constantly reach back down and try to pull me up. And he said the worst types of people are those that once they get to the top of the ladder, pull up the ladder mm -hmm. or refuse to reach back down. And I think that that's very, very true. Uh, and uh, I think we all benefit from the, the kindness and the patience of, of mentors. So other questions?
make a, a, a woman, you have you want to have women in the in the caucus so that women's issues are are addressed. You want to have African Americans so that African American issues are addressed. So I'm wondering your perspective on uh, I have a in my, my household is a is a fairly democratic household. I have <laughs> Um, but I look at things one way, my wife looks at things the other, and we, there are two issues, and, and we see them differently. But it, is the, but it is that diversity and the differences in terms of how we see things that bring us back together and, and, and have us come up with perhaps a, a, a credible interpretation or a credible solution to a particular problem. So do we ever get to the point where, where we have diversity in politics for that reason? Diversity, not for our um, parochial concerns, which are important, but also diversity that leads us to, to, to a point where we begin to make better decisions politically as a result of that diversity. You know, when, when you, we speak about caucuses, I think the point is uh, that if you, if you don't have that caucus, the issue might not be even discussed. And I think the importance is, uh, no matter what the result is, but that the issues are raised and that the different, in every minority group and in, in every couple, as I mean, if, when you have two more than one person together, you're gonna have differences and that's, that's basic. But to the extent that those issues are discussed and that we can have better legislation, better decision making, uh, and if we, what I've seen from my experience that Sometimes when those uh, groups or coalitions or caucuses are, do not exist, the issues are not raised or the issues are not discussed. And we have to begin by discussing them in order to get uh, results. Uh, so I believe that it is important. One thing, uh, I don't know if you have that here in the States, I don't think so, but in Puerto Rico we have what, what they call in March is Semana de la Mujer, which is, this is the week of women. And we have all these panels, discussions, where we have all these women in the audience. And I said, listen, we, we women know all our issues. We need to have men in here so that they find out what our issues are. We keep discussing and having this week every year where we're discussing the same issues. We all know what our issues are. We need to get people from outside, men, to, to bring about you know, a change and to, and to make, create awareness because to the extent that we continue to discuss the same issues among ourselves, we're never going to uh, raise the awareness. And I think somebody mentioned, I don't know if it was here this morning or in the other, uh, in the other panel, uh, that same thing that we need to have, that the white uh, male or the white female uh, needs to get involved and be part of the solution. Uh, not only the minorities, everybody has to get involved in order to bring about solutions and change uh, to whatever situation we have. So, so, so I believe that the discussion is important and that the issues need to be raised. And sometimes if you do not have a coalition, if you do not have a caucus with regards to some uh, group or some issue, the, dis the issue is simply it's not uh, uh, raised. Do you, want, do you mind if we take more questions? Or is that
So when I was at Penn, I actually helped lead the coalition that first pushed the cultural <laughs> competency requirement. So maybe I can just speak briefly about the reasons uh, for that. Uh, when I was an undergrad, um, I was one of the leaders of the Latino coalition, uh, and we joined with the African American coalition, and it was uh, the United Minorities Council and the Asian American Pacific Islander group. I can't remember what it's called. APSC, thank you, um, to advocate for the idea that in today's global world, um, we need to understand different cultures and different perspectives. Um, just as a pen says that you need to have some familiarity with science to make it in the world, that you should also have experience with different types of culture. There is no profession that is forgiven from this rule. Every profession has, to some extent, um, conflicts among people of different backgrounds, and we thought that it would be really great if these conversations and these engagements began. Uh, and we also believed that when an institution like Penn, a top Ivy League university, a global leader in higher education, puts something into curriculum, it's a way of saying that this is something that we value as an institution. Um, it's, it's one of the ways that you put highest value on something like cultural competency. And so we were trying to have the university make a statement, which I think is very clear and I think very important. Um, but I would also just say that starting, one of the arguments against was that these conversations can't just start in college. Um, you know, I was speaking earlier with my mom, actually, and she said, you know, the best way to deal with um, a lot of these issues of bullying is to begin tackling kids when they're young, uh, when they're in kindergarten and preschool and having them, you know, have these conversations with their teachers and other kids. So I think that that's sort of a, a great place to begin. And certainly if we don't begin working with kids at a young age and socializing children uh, with people of different backgrounds, then by the time that they're adults, they're not going to have the same receptiveness to that kind of engagement. Do we have anything to add? Matt? Uh, I, I, I heard uh, President Gutman mention this morning this culture, cultural diversity requirement, which she didn't explain, but which I thought sounded very good. Uh, and I agree with you that this shouldn't be, sh we shouldn't start here at the university level, but at this point, if, if it hasn't started early, we have to start somewhere. <laughs> so at the, so, so I, I applaud uh, the effort that the university and the students like Jesse, uh, the effort that they made so that finally we could get a requirement like this uh, put into the, into the curriculum. Um, I'm gonna, I was thinking of my daughter because of two things. Uh, I'm gonna, if you allow me, I'm briefly two incidents I had with my daughter who's now 11 years old. First, when she was in first grade, her teacher asked her, one of her teachers asked her to find a picture of the profession that she wanted to be when she was older. So we start looking at different uh, books and stuff and we find, uh, that we couldn't get, she want, I don't recall what her profession was she wanted to be at that time, but we couldn't get a picture of a female dressed up in that position, we only, in that profession. We only had uh, female nurses and female uh, teachers. All the pictures that we found were uh, male, and these were uh, uh, published uh, books that we had from our local uh, schools, and we couldn't find a single, and you know, it made me realize at the time she was in first grade that we are uh, telling our children from the very beginning, uh, and this is very subtle, but you, you, as a female, you do not find in these publications any picture of a, of a, of a female dressed up in, in a doctor's or, or, or a lawyer or whatever position, you know, whatever profession she wanted to be at the time, or a police woman, or whatever. And, and it's something that, we, that it got me thinking, you know, I and mean, we really have to, as Jesse mentioned, we have to start this from the very beginning. The other thing is that I sent her to the States uh, for the past summer so she would learn English. And she mentioned that, uh, that many, you know, that the girls uh, that she was with 
uh, since they watched the program Dora the Explorer, that they could relate to her, you know, that they can, you know, and I said, well, you know, well, it's through a TV program, but it's wonderful that it's uh, raised some kind of consciousness to the fact that there are people who speak other languages and whose name might be in Spanish, et cetera. So, so I think that we have as, 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 as countries, as nations, in the case of the United States, to raise the awareness very early on because to the extent that by the time we get to college, uh, we already have this way of thinking, uh, we might have this requirement which might you know, be taken as any other requirement uh, it's necessary, and I'm really glad that it's there, but we definitely have to move that early on. But I applaud the effort, and I think it's very important, and I hope that it makes a difference in what we see out there once we graduate, because uh, I, I, I was very pleased to hear Professor Gottman mention the 44% minority rate here at the school right now, uh, because it's, uh, that's a world out there. It's not only white people, it's people of color, it's uh, different uh, sexual orientation, different uh, minority groups, linguistic groups, all kinds of groups, and I think it's, that's, that's life. And life is not being white, or life is not being Jewish only, or life is not being African American, or Puerto Rican, or, 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 or Asian American. It's being part of a place where we're all together. So, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, <laughs> I just wanted to talk about a little bit about that. Do you want to add something, or do you want? Um, just come back to it again. I think it's important that, again, to live a diverse lifestyle, we have to go beyond our traditional borders, beyond our traditional groups. And as individuals, we can do that in our daily lives. But more importantly, as leaders of our institutions, we have to create a culture that promotes that. Again, in the foreign service, I come back to it. We have incorporated into our promotion criteria, which is incentivizing the individual, uh, the need for creating a diverse workplace. Again, it's not that you work in a diverse place. It's not that you, know, you value diversity, that you can work with someone from a different background than yours. No, you have a positive duty to create a diverse workplace. And that's built into our promotion requirements. Um, you know, in the private sector, you're motivated by, obviously, economic return and profit. But corporations have long since realized that it's in their economic interest to reach out, to expand, to incorporate that feedback into the product development, to the product marketing, et cetera, et cetera. So if we create as leaders incentives within our organizations to value the diversity and to change the individual behavior, I think that's what we can do proactively. Again, to make a proactive duty upon us to encourage people to go beyond their traditional borders, to reach out, and to find the commonalities and to acknowledge the differences.